And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 20, 2021 Climate Jobs Summit to the UN Climate Week NYC and our first plenary of the day on the American Jobs Plan, Impacts and Opportunities for Clean Energy and Good Jobs. As Emma said, my name is Lara Skinner. I direct the Labor Leading on Climate Program at Cornell, uh, part of ILR's Worker Institute and the academic partner to the Climate Jobs National Resource Center. And I'm really happy to be here with you all today. Thanks for joining. We are really delighted to follow Deputy White House National Climate Advisor Ali Zaidi's excellent remarks that he just made uh, with this panel discussion on the American Jobs Plan. Um, we're looking forward to really digging into the potential climate jobs and equity impacts and opportunities of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, as well as the Infrastructure Reconciliation Plan. So joining me uh, for this panel today, we have five excellent speakers that I'm going to introduce. We have Dr. Marilyn Brown, the Regents and Brooke Byers Professor of Sustainable Systems in the School of Public Policy at Georgia Institute of Technology, where she created and co-leads the Climate and Energy Policy Lab and the Master of Sustainable Energy and Environmental Management Program. Uh, Marilyn is an expert on the jobs and cost impacts of clean energy systems, um, and joined us at last year's summit. Some of you may remember her. So welcome, Marilyn. We also have John Podesta, founder and a member of the board of directors for the Center for American Progress, CAP. As many of you know, John served as counselor to President Barack Obama, where he was responsible for coordinating the administration's climate policy and initiatives. John previously served as White House Chief of Staff to President Bill Clinton, and he chaired Hillary Clinton's campaign for president in 2016. So thank you for being here, John. Our third panelist is John Doherty. John is the special assistant to the president of the International Union of Painters and Allied Trades, the Painters Union. The painters represent over 160,000 active and retired men and women in the US and Canada working in the finishing trades. Uh, this includes industrial and commercial painters, drywall finishers, wall covers, glaziers, glass workers, floor covering installers, sign makers, and a host of other finishing trades. Previously, John served as Director of Communications for the Painters Union and in Communications and Organizing with the Union's District Council 35, which re represents um, much of New England. So welcome, John. It's great to have you here. Our fourth panelist is Chris Shelton. Um, in 2015, uh, Chris was elected President of the Communication Workers of America, CWA, um, which represents members in communications and information industries, new media, airlines, broadcast and cable television, public service, higher ed, healthcare, manufacturing, high tech, and more. Prior to his election as president, Shelton served as vice president of CWA District 1, representing 160,000 members in more than 300 CWA locals in New Jersey, New York, and New England. Thanks so much for participating in this panel, Chris. And last but not least, we have John Cartwright. John is the retired president of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council, representing 200,000 union members who work in every sector of the economy. He's a carpenter by trade, um, and he led the Central Ontario Building Trades Council for a decade before being elected uh, to president of the Toronto York Region Labor Council. Um, and we are delighted to have John here and to talk about um, some comparable experiences in Canada. Um, so welcome, John, to this uh, panel discussion. So just to give you sort of a, a lay of the land and the plan here, we're going to get right into a couple of uh, rounds of questions of our panelists, and then we're going to open it up to discussion for uh, questions from the audience. And as Emma said, Zach is going to help us with that. Um, I want to remind you that we'll be using Slido, um, as Emmett mentioned. Um, that's how you can ask questions during this panel. You can scan the QR code on your screen, or you can type in our event number, 464766, on slido.com. Uh, once you're on the Slido page, type in your question in the box uh, at the top of the page at any time, and we're, we're going to fit your, your questions into this uh, discussion. So thank you uh, for doing that. So. Um, I'm gonna jump right into our questions. Marilyn, I'm gonna start with you. Um, as we've heard from a couple of the other speakers, when President Biden came into office, he quickly rejoined the Paris Climate Agreement um, and committed to taking strong action to address the climate crisis, reduce greenhouse gas emissions and pollution, and build back better from the COVID-19 pandemic and economic crisis. 
by dramatically scaling up the clean energy economy and climate jobs, much of the vision that Ali just laid out in his remarks. Biden and Democratic leaders were hoping to meet these goals through a large infrastructure package um, that would simultaneously take on climate, COVID, and equity issues. We're now looking at two opportunities to do this in a big way, the $1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill and the $3.5 trillion budget reconciliation package. So Marilyn, I think it would be great if we could start off by having you tell us what's in these bills that will help us tackle climate change and create jobs. What aspects of these packages do you find most encouraging? What's not in there that's important to tackling climate change? Let us know kind of what's in these bills to take on uh, the climate crisis and job creation. Thanks, Marilyn. All right, thanks, Laura. Well, there's a lot in both of these bills, so I'm just gonna be able to uh, highlight some of the uh, key points that I am particularly um, optimistic about. So let's start with a 1.2 trillion bipartisan infrastructure investment and jobs act. It contains funds for traditional infrastructure, roads, bridges, airports, public transit, grid modernization, broadband access, and much more. All of these will help strengthen our infrastructure to better cope with increasing climate extremes, you know, to prevent them from becoming catastrophic. Um, but also, they will modernize our systems and will help us to compete globally, as well as transitioning to a clean energy economy. So how does the clean energy economy transition occur in this bill? It's going to be, um, it's, there are many parts to it. Transportation in the U.S. is now the largest greenhouse gas contributor, recently eclipsing the power system. And this bill will greatly expand electric vehicle charging and electric public transit. So together, these two investments will help move us away from the uh, petroleum-based mobility that dominates the U.S., the second sector that's uh, the biggest, the second largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. is the power sector. And there's a lot in the infrastructure bill that will help to decarbonize it. By strengthening our electric grid, the U.S. Um, will be able to better access the regions of the U.S., that don't have a great deal of solar and wind will be able to access these renewable resources better to help offset coal and natural gas and to strengthen the reliability of their power systems. Um, the investment in the grid will help prevent crises like the Texas power um, disaster in February that uh, could have been avoided with better transmission infrastructure. You know, the continental U.S. is uh, comprised of three independent synchronized grids linked only by a few low capacity power lines. If we could enhance those connections, uh, Texas will not have a repeat of uh, that catastrophe. It won't be isolated from the other two interconnection systems um, and it also will not be as vulnerable. So that's the over quick overview of the infrastructure uh, bill. Now let's turn to the Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill, uh, which would be the largest investment in climate change mitigation. And the centerpiece of this bill is called the Clean Energy Payment Program, the CEPP. This program would provide payments to electricity generation companies that reduce the carbon intensity of their sales. And it would levy penalties against those companies that fall short. Um, major uh, transformation will result through this payment and penalty system. There are other parts to the bill, too, that address many of the equity and inclusion issues that Ali Zaidi was talking about. There'll be a green bank established that will help resource low-income households and disadvantaged communities that have suffered from historic environmental injustice. Uh, there will be payment for the deployment of electric vehicles, not just the construction of 
EV charging infrastructures. Um, there'll be funds to weatherize homes and offices and build those uh, carbon-free schools that we need. So as a package, the Build Back Better uh, reconciliation bill would not only transition to low carbon electricity and transportation, but it would also reduce inequality and address disadvantaged communities. Taken together, um, it's been estimated that the job impacts, the job of growth that would result from these investments would range from two to four million per year over the course of the next decade. Those jobs would be in a variety of um, sectors of the economy, in construction, in manufacturing, new wind turbines, new EVs, new electronics, and other areas. Um, Ali Zaidi did a great job detailing these, providing living wages across the, the country. And the living wages from these bills will uplift the purchasing power of households. Uh, that means expenditures on food, fashion, and fun. You know, we often don't uh, explicitly acknowledge the magic of job multipliers. We'll see more, uh, we'll see a greater growth in some of these uh, household in general um, uh, the economic uh, sectors. So the Build Back Better Reconciliation Bill is analogous to FDR's New Deal and to Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, which were historic transformations that greatly strengthened society in the last century. So now we have the unique opportunity to transform society for the better in this century as our economy rapidly expands, but is currently leaving out whole sectors of society and failing to address environmental challenges. These bills will not only tackle climate change, but they'll create shared prosperity by reducing inequality and building a more vibrant middle class. Thanks, Laura, back to you. Thanks, Marilyn, that was a really helpful overview of these two bills. Um, we're going to hear from John Podesta in a little bit on what it's going to take these bills, which I think is kind of top of mind for a lot of folks that are tuning in. Um, before we move to that, I want to go to you, John Doherty. Um, President Biden has made it clear that addressing climate change and scaling clean energy are critical goals of the American Jobs Plan and these bills. I want to hear more about why the Painters Union is supporting these major climate and clean energy investments uh, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill and in the reconciliation package. How are these investments to address climate change and scale clean energy um, going to support the painters membership? And why do you think it's so important that they have the, and, and how do they have the greatest climate jobs and equity impact? Um, a couple questions for you, John. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so first of all, jobs. Um, that's really what our members rely upon that's what all Americans rely on is the jobs that are going to come out of this infrastructure package um green jobs for example though uh currently are just jobs they're not good jobs they're not protected by labor standards uh in a lot of cases and for us as a union that's what we're looking at right now is how do we get in and mobilize around these jobs make sure that labor standards are attached to these jobs and that they, they provide the best benefit, not only to our members, but having us have the ability to organize out there in a lot of the marginalized communities that we talk about. A um, couple different areas that, that we're looking at. Number one, obviously uh, the wind industry. Uh, right now there are tens of thousands of turbines uh, across the United States, uh, most of which are uh, maintained not even by um, not just union members, but not even by Americans. Uh, there are a lot of companies that come from overseas to maintain those, that put the coatings that our members do on those projects. So ensuring that the infrastructure funding that comes down has labor standards attached, is going to be the biggest benefit, uh, not only to our members, but also enable us to expand our apprenticeship systems um, to get more workers from more communities into those jobs. Uh, housing is another area. Uh, the nation's uh, housing and urban development 
footprint um, is a huge number of jobs. In New York alone, there's 400,000 uh, housing units that could be retrofitted that our members do work in, in weatherization, in putting in uh, energy efficient glass uh, to increase the efficiency of those buildings. Uh, also in new structures, putting in architectural glass to make sure that we capture uh, the sun's power in, in electrifying those buildings as well. One other area is the schools. Um, this country has um, probably 100,000 school buildings around the country that also need retrofit, that also could provide those jobs uh, through apprenticeship that we can do outreach in, in all communities around those schools, especially in impacted communities that a lot of these public schools exist around. Uh, so those are three areas uh, in this budget um, that would impact our members and also allow us to uh, increase our footprint exponentially in a lot of communities that desperately need those jobs. Thanks, John. Um, it's just uh, super exciting to have us all talking about the potential here, you know, carbon free, healthy schools, public buildings, affordable housing, the way that, you know, we can really take on climate change and reduce emissions and pollution for the communities that are most impacted by it, um, but also be creating a lot of high quality jobs and you know, uh, potentially lowering, lowering energy bills um, for folks who need it most. So just, just so much potential here. It's really exciting to be talking about this. Um, Chris Shelton, let's go over to you and talk a little bit about manufacturing. Much of the research on clean energy has shown that the majority of jobs um, are in the manufacturing of clean energy projects. Um, we saw this when we went to Denmark to learn about the offshore wind industry. You know, about twice as many jobs are in the manufacturing and assembly of offshore wind turbines than there are in the construction. So, you know, that's a really important part for us to, to capture if we're really trying to use these packages to drive job creation. Um, and economic development in the U.S. So tell us a little bit about what opportunities exist for CWA's membership in clean energy manufacturing and how can the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the reconciliation package really drive investments in domestic manufacturing and support uh, your membership um, and U.S. workers? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, CWA is involved in our manufacturing division with about 50,000 members is involved in all kinds of manufacturing. Uh, the one program that we're actively uh, chasing right now is uh, offshore wind and particularly in New York right at the moment. And uh, the offshore wind industry uh, presents us a, a great opportunity here because we represent members at uh, General Electric, and we, we're trying to convince Equinor, who has the contract for offshore wind in New York, to use General Electric as uh, a, a builder of their turbines for their offshore wind uh, uh, product. And, um, you know, um, these offshore, the, the offshore wind product or the turbines, we already build turbines in our plant in Schenectady, New York at, at General Electric. And we already know how to do it. We know how to do it right. Uh, we don't, uh, we haven't built turbines on the scale that we would need to uh, use for offshore wind, but uh, it's uh, a very simple process when you're already building turbines. So um, Equinor has not made a decision yet on who the uh, um, um, manufacturer of the turbines is going to be, but we feel we are uniquely qualified in Schenectady, New York, to build these turbines because uh, the canal system for New York is uh, right adjacent to our plant in Schenectady. The, the Schenectady plant, as I said, already builds turbines, and uh, the uh, ability to build the turbines that we need and to get them where we need them uh, is unique to our GE plant in Schenectady. So we're trying to convince Equinor, the New York State government, and GE uh, to do this work. And uh, we think that uh, it's a, a slam dunk, not only for us, but uh, for GE and for Equinor and for the American public to have uh, the turbines built there. We also obviously 
by our name, you can figure out that we have a lot to do with uh, uh, broadband. Uh, and you didn't ask me about broadband yet, but you know we've discovered during the pandemic that broadband is like electricity or water, and you got to have broadband or else uh, there's no way to operate during a pandemic. And uh, the uh, broadband uh, capabilities in the United States are so low that lots of people were cut out during the uh, pandemic. For instance, we had kids sitting in McDonald's parking lot trying to do their homework because they were unable to to access broadband in their homes. And uh, my members are uniquely qualified, uniquely qualified to uh, build out the, the broadband infrastructure in the United States and to maintain it. What we don't want to do here is is put a lot of government money into broadband and, and have it done by uh, unqualified, non-union uh, contractors who pay no attention to the people that they hire and no attention to safety. For instance, there was a, a broadband contractor used in upstate New York uh, recently that uh, hit a gas line and blew up half the town. Uh, my members know how to do this. Uh, they should be the ones that are doing it. They should be the ones that are maintaining it. And, you know, all of this stuff, the, the wind stuff and the broadband, uh, you know, you, you got to use union members to, to make good union jobs to improve the economy in the United States. And we feel that uh, any of this is uh, going to enhance uh, uh, the Biden administration's Build Back Better uh, by American and certainly uh, addressing uh, the climate problems. So that, that's what we're currently into besides all the uh, already clean manufacturing uh, uh, examples that we have. So thank you. Back to you. That's great. Thanks, Chris. And uh, we're closely monitoring CWA's campaign to have offshore wind turbines manufactured in Schenectady. If you haven't uh, seen the video that CWA did on this, um, uh, definitely check it out. It's great. And um, thanks, Chris, for really sort of laying out the important connection between these investments and creating high quality family community sustaining union jobs that are actually going to reverse inequality. Um, you know, this is, this is, this is how we take on inequality, right. Is by making sure that the, the jobs that we're creating are good jobs that can really sort of support families and communities um, and that the work is done safely and of the best quality. So that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, John Cartwright, I want to go to you next. You led the largest labor council in Canada and addressing climate change, creating good jobs, meeting equity goals have been top priorities for your council. What can we learn from Canada on how best to tackle, ch tackle climate change, um, create high quality jobs and address equity? Um, you know, especially in this political moment where we're negotiating these American jobs plans. Um, and in particular, can you tell us about the better building partnerships and the green print for a greater Toronto or better Toronto and how these programs helped advance jobs, equity, and climate goals in Toronto. I think it would be helpful for us to, to hear about those um, programs um, today. Sure, thanks, Laura. And you know, this is a really important conversation you're having today. I wanna honor the hard work and determination of everybody who's been involved in this process. And you know, we've had some successes in Canada, but we're constantly learning from each other. We're learning across our borders. We're learning from the, the labor movement across this world. And, you know, our country was an uh, early leader, signed on to Kyoto, you know, proclaimed a lot of good policies, but also, you know, massive expansion of the bitumen tar sands in northern Alberta. That, that uh, means we have a heavier carbon footprint as a, as a country than we like to talk about. Um, I'm a construction worker. I started, you know, as a local union rep, organizing unorganized workers, fighting to transform our industry around health and safety at a time when they said, you know, don't make these changes, just go along with the old ways, and also trying to figure out how our unions could embrace equity and diversity. And in the early 1990s, the whole real estate market collapsed all across North America, and we had 30 40% unemployment, uh, people losing homes, suicides, breaking up families, and I stepped into leadership of our local building trades council, and people were desperate for a job. Uh, but the market wasn't there. We couldn't just make stuff out of thin air until one day we ran into a company, uh, which was the only engineering firm that hadn't shed half of its workforce. And it had discovered a niche market of going to 
class A building owners and saying, you know, your building's using way too much energy. We can dramatically cut your costs by doing a retrofit. Uh, we'll do an audit. We'll bring a contractor. Uh, uh, we'll do the financing. And at the end of the day, you'll be uh, paying 30%, 40% less in your costs. And after a net period of time, when we take those savings, we're gone. So we sat down with those people and said, could we make this a bigger scale? And then we reached out to our, our uh, allies and uh, municipal council and said, let's try and create a city program called the Better Buildings Partnership. Uh, we used some money from a, a national infrastructure program, only $12 million to securitize all the loans that were required for this. Uh, city staff came and promoted it and supported it, and it uh, expanded across Class A buildings, schools, hospitals, and high-rise residentials. So in the first decade of that program, 47,000 uh, years worth of work and 680,000 uh, tons of CO2 reduced. And, you know, that's a mega project uh, times 10 times 20. So, and because of our high level of unionization, most of those were union jobs. That experience, that is not jobs versus the environment, but we can have both, gave us the confidence in 1999 to work and help present uh, to the Canadian Labor Congress Convention a paper on green jobs that was passed unanimously. And this in spite of the fact that our loggers were in the war of the woods out west with the environmentalists and originally they wanted to vote against it. We sat down and we said, this will only work if everybody in every sector is at the table shaping the approach for the sector, how it impacts your members. Because you know your industry and you know your communities way better than anybody else. And that to me is the key and that's part of what you're trying to do uh, with this. Of course, uh, you know, as people saw that tech change, our training centers were, uh, you know, taking uh, solar and wind, smart buildings, mass timber, geothermal, district heating, all into the training centers and either upgrading journey persons or bringing that to apprentices. In Paris in 2015, I was there for the COP21 and came back and said, we got to figure out how to do this across every sector. So our green pin for Greater Toronto has many of the elements that you see in the American Jobs Plan, clean energy, retrofits, uh, vehicles, transit, schools, manufacturing and supply chain, housing, equity, and resilience. Because it's not just about the high emitting industries. It's how do, we, how do we move every single workplace to a low carbon future? We're still working on how we create the vehicles for labor and management to sit down sector by sector, large workplace by work, large workplace to achieve that low carbon future. Um, but I want to add on one last piece, and that's community benefits. I was fortunate to be in Los Angeles about uh, uh, 15 years ago and start talking to the folks there about the community benefits programs, about saying if there's going to be large infrastructure, you have to build in equity. You have to put targets in for hiring uh, racialized uh, youth, women, and, and other uh, disadvantaged communities into these workforces. And that's been part of the, the shared prosperity agenda that we've been creating Today, and I'm so happy to see that within, again, the American Jobs Plan, equity is right there, uh, green is right there, and, uh, and you're trying to move forward. I'll leave you with this. You know, Wayne Gretzky, the famous hockey player, when he was asked, you know, what was the secret to success, always used to say, I'm going to skate to where the puck will be. And what you're doing with the American Jobs Plan is trying to figure out how you will be where the puck will be at the right time. Thanks. Hey, John, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you. And I think, you know, I mean, that's what this is all about is how do we, how do we really do this stuff at scale? Because, you know, as Gary LaBarbera said earlier, we're on the clock here, right? Um, we're behind in tackling the climate crisis. We're behind in tackling inequality and being an international leader on clean energy issues. And so figuring out the policies and programs that really allow us to reduce emissions and create union jobs at the scale and pace that we need to address the climate crisis is, is um, critically important at this moment. So thanks for, for the insight on those programs um, in, in Ontario. Um, I see we've got uh, John Podesta here. Um, John was just meeting with Senator Ron Wyden um, about uh, the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill and the reconciliation package. So John, I wanna go to you. Um, we heard from Marilyn about what's in these package, uh, in these packages. You've been involved in a lot of the negotiations to invest big in climate protection and clean energy and really use it to drive high quality job creation and a strong fair economy. 
Um, you probably have a better uh, inside perspective on these packages than most. Can you kind of give us the current state of play? Um, let us know what is it going to take to pass these packages in the House and Senate? Um, how how are their scope and ambition um, going to be impacted um, over the coming weeks and months? And I think in particular, a lot of our audience wants to know what's happening with the labor standards that we need in these packages to ensure that these are going to be high quality family and community sustaining union jobs. So John Podesta, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Laura. And uh, I am sorry to be late. Uh, I, I was uh, getting it straight from the horse's mouth. Uh, the uh, Senator Wyden put together as chairman of the Finance Committee a very strong package of tax support for the clean energy industry that included very strong labor standards. I'm come back to a couple of things without violating any confidences that he just said. Uh, and that uh, uh, package includes uh, very massive investments uh, in uh, support for uh, renewable energy, uh, for manufacturing, for uh, some of the new technologies like hydrogen, et cetera. They, uh, it goes and is in combination really with the bipartisan infrastructure bill that passed the Senate in the summer. Uh, but the bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, which has uh, very significant uh, investments uh, in highways, in transit, in rail, uh, in clean water, in, uh, in broadband, uh, to clean up abandoned uh, gas and oil wells uh, for transmission, doesn't really do the job when it comes to addressing the challenges that we've been discussing, which is to reduce emissions overall. In order to that, we need more transformation and the so-called budget reconciliation package, the Build Back Better bill, which will pass only with Democratic votes. The Republicans have stated their opposition to it. Uh, has to go really in tandem. These are complementary pieces. They're complementary in politics and they're complementary in substance. The enabling uh, environment that the infrastructure bill does is critical, but these uh, big investments in clean energy uh, in, the, in transforming the, the power sector uh, will uh, again uh, be transformative. In the tax side of that bill, which we were just discussing, uh, the just on the clean uh, power side, uh, the there are uh, good solid projections that that will create uh, 800,000 jobs, a net increase of 600,000 jobs in the power sector uh, uh, in the next decade. The labor standards are strong. First time they've been this strong applied really to tax provisions with prevailing wage. Uh, the uh, the provisions, um, the penalty provisions of the PRO Act, not the whole PRO Act is included in this bill because of the uh, issues in the Senate regarding uh, the so-called Byrd Rule, which doesn't permit everything to ride along with reconciliation, but a very significant amount of uh, and important provisions of the PRO Act are included uh, in this package. Uh, there's provisions to uh, in the Ways and Means side and the House side uh, to restore the above the line deduction for union dues, another important feature uh, that's important to the lead, uh, union family. There's provisions to, to do what, um, uh, what Bre uh, Randy and Becky talked about earlier to build carbon free and healthy schools, very substantial amount of money uh, for that. So, uh, a huge amount is riding on this. And uh, I think that uh, the other thing that uh, is included in these investments are Buy America provisions uh, that will bring manufacturing jobs back to the United States, will ensure that the, that the work that's being done, whether that's in the offshore wind sector, in the onshore wind sector, in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, uh, in the power sector more generally, uh, and particularly good provisions in, in their uh, a bonus uh, with respect to the consumer credits to buy electric vehicles for union made, uh, for cars that are built in, in, uh, in union factories. Uh, all that means uh, not only that we will, that this will be the most transformative investment package uh, like 
uh, the American Recovery Act that passed in 2009 on steroids, but it will be done with a great regard for the fact that these have to be good uh, paying, family sustaining jobs with support for unionization uh, in this work. So together with the work that's being done at the state level through uh, the climate job state tables, the support that's included in this package would just be a boom uh, to work across this country. But we're at a very delicate moment. Uh, the package uh, that, uh, that the budget that the Senate and House agreed to was for $3.5 trillion worth of investments, not just in clean energy, uh, but in child care and family care and home health care, uh, in improved Medicare uh, uh, and Medicaid. That overall package is being, the, the top line is being pushed down by forces, moderate forces, uh, particularly by Senator Manchin and Senator Sinema in the Senate, but also by House moderates uh, in the House. They need to land on a deal, uh, and we don't have a lot of time. This, this has got a certain shelf life. Uh, in my view, this has to be done in just the next few weeks. Uh, so there's very broad agreement across the Democratic caucus in both the Senate and the House, but we're in a situation with a 50-50 Senate where you got to get every Democratic senator to vote for it, and you basically have to have every Democratic House uh, member uh, voting for it. So the give and take is rough and tumble right now. Um, uh, but I'll close with something that that I, I don't think I uh, uh, Chairman Wyden would mind my, my saying, which is that uh, uh, there's some complaints from the clean energy industry about the Buy America provisions in particular. And uh, uh, the chairman reiterated the fact that the only way he could put that bill together uh, you know, with people like Sherrod Brown uh, and, uh, and you know, a broad range of people whose, ha whose heart and soul uh, is in uh, ensuring that their workers do well in this new economy is to have the Buy America provisions, the strong labor standards. Uh, we've seen that happen in the House side. Now we got to make it happen overall, and we got to get this bill done uh, and I think that, you know, the White House is engaged with these delicate negotiations, but everything's on the line right now. Really helpful update, John. Um, it's great to get that kind of uh, real-time update. Um, I know when Biden was first elected, we were incredibly relieved and hopeful to have a president who was talking about unions, climate change, and equity in the same sentence. And it's great to see that continued um, commitment. And I know the labor standards you're outlining are very similar to what was included in Washington's climate and jobs legislation. And um, Mike Fishman and I have been talking to, to leaders in Washington and have been encouraged to hear that uh, many solar and wind projects are going union um, uh, given the sort of tax incentive and labor standard structure that they've set up. So um, uh, great to, to hear that update, thank you. Uh, Lark, if I could just add one second. Uh, yeah. Developers lose a lot of the advantage if they don't pay prevailing wage and they don't use qualified apprentices. Yeah. So I think this really is intended not only just to support working families, but to give some incentive for developers to stop their anti-union behavior and be able to work uh, in conjunction through project labor agreements, et cetera, to, to uh, you know, uh, turn around the lack of labor density we've seen happen in this country. So, yeah, yeah absolutely. That's great. Um, John Carre, I want to go back uh, to you, do a second round of questions uh, to all of our panelists. Um, you know, clearly, as you outlined kind of the programs that have worked well in Canada, good policy is important to taking on climate equity and job creation issues. Um, but in your work with the Toronto York Labor Council, I think you've put a lot of emphasis on integrating a good policy agenda with worker organizing and taking on racial, indigenous, and gender equity issues in a real way. Can you talk more about why prioritizing equity and organizing work has been so important to your approach to this work? 
And how do you think we can use the American Jobs Plan to support equity and organizing goals? Well, you know, the, the really ambitious program that John Podesta just outlined, it won't be one without power. And I speak to a lot of union conferences, conventions, uh, uh, other uh, spaces to talk about the three elements of building power. And the first is to have a strategic plan. The second is to have membership engagement. And the third is to have an alliance policy. So your climate jobs network that you've been building over these last couple of years clearly has a strategic plan. It pulls together the real opportunities for real jobs with a vision uh, about uh, climate justice. The membership engagement is the tricky part you're involved now. You're reaching out to key unions, you're deepening the, the breadth of this alliance uh, in order to actually have working people banging at the door of, of their elected representatives saying, we want these uh, regulations in this plan. And then the alliance policy is somewhat, you know, how you got to the American Jobs Plan, your alliance with your political leaders, with others in the environmental communities uh, has got you there. Uh, and you've identified the need to ensure that communities of color are part of this, uh, this outline. And for me, uh, all of this has to be seen with an, an organizing agenda that's got a strong commitment to equity. So we've already know what COVID has, has laid bare in terms of, of, of racial inequality. But here's the thing, and I have to say as a Canadian, from looking at the White House outline, the jobs plan says create good quality jobs that pay prevailing wages in safe and healthy workplaces while ensuring workers have a free and fair choice to organize, join a union, and bargain collectively with their employers. That's pretty damn impressive, I have to tell you. And it's also going to be the key target for those who people who are opposing uh, this agenda. I, I think that the U.S. labor movement can build tremendous momentum behind that vision, where organizers, where human rights and anti-racism activists, where political action leaders and your community allies can come together in a multifaceted response. You know, I talked about the Better Buildings Partnership, but the other thing we did in the 90s, uh, where many of the building trades across North America were retreating to the you know, defend the big industrial projects and commercial projects, we did the opposite. We went out and, and put together multi-union organizing drives in low-rise housing. We, our organizers spoke many, many different languages. We welcomed thousands of new immigrants to our, into our unions, and we leveraged the power relationships with the industry players. And that ended up, along with industry and political campaigns, we came out of that recession with one of the highest levels of, of unionization construction in North America because we combined those kinds of conversations, uh, not just on the job site, but within communities in the, in the local cafes and the halls and the churches and the mosques, anywhere we needed to be in order that people would feel a confidence to say, I want a union voice at work. Um, now that's construction. In the last 20 years, I've been involved in workers in every sector. And we adopted uh, uh, 20 years ago, a very, very aggressive equity agenda to engage and empower workers of color. Because in Toronto, half of us are born outside of Canada and half of us are people of color. And you know that's both for principled reasons about doing the right thing and practical reasons because it's the only way you actually do build power. And it's uh, you know about sharing space and making sure uh, activists of color are stepping up, women leaders are stepping up and not only bringing wisdom, but also providing the energy uh, for a, a renewed labor movement who sees climate justice in this frame. And I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, importance in the world intentionality, that you have to be intentional and you have to be actionable in the things you're doing. So having the entire labor movement across the U.S. coming behind this plan can provide a vital space for united action. The unions that aren't yet part of this in an active way, uh, but I'm really pleased to see you've got the education unions and others, you know, uh, coming into this conversation, because that's the way you're going to win economic, social, racial, and climate justice for a whole generation coming forward. And I think those are some of the things I've seen. That's great. Thank you, John. That's really inspiring. I think just what we need in this this moment, um, Chris Shelton. I want to come back to you. Um, you know, a couple things here. John mentioned that there's been resistance to the domestic content and Buy America provisions um, in these packages. Um, I want to give you a chance to respond to that. 
Um, the other thing I'm thinking is, you know, we have seen um, more progress in other countries outside the U.S. They've been more successful at building up uh, clean energy supply chains. Uh, supply chains. Can you talk a little bit about that? You know, why why have they been more successful, and how could the sort of current legislation help us make um, additional strides in this area? Those are the two things I'm thinking about. Um, and then just before I turn it over to you, Chris, I want to remind our audience um, that we're using Slido to ask questions during this panel. Um, we're going to open it up to questions from the audience in just a minute. So make sure you scan the QR code on your screen or type in the event, event number 464766 on Slido.com. And you can uh, type your question in the box at the top of the page. Um, if you feel comfortable, please, you know, include your name and your organization, um, or you can ask anonymously, but it'd be great to, to get questions from the audience and bring you all into this discussion. So, um, Chris, I want to give you a chance to, to respond to the, the bits around Buy America and the resistance we're seeing. And Chris, you're on mute. Sorry. How many times have we all said that over the last <laughs> year and a half? Um, you know the, the Buy American provisions in the uh, in the in both the bills actually uh, are just a no-brainer for anybody in this country. I mean, it, it shouldn't be a big uh, problem to get uh, manufacturers or whoever to buy American uh, because uh, that's how we keep our economy going. You know, too many manufacturers and, and others have gone overseas to do things, including. Uh, my friends at GE, uh, you know, uh, we, we had a, a plant in Bucyrus, Ohio, that made LED light bulbs that just recently the GE uh, ran the plant and shipped the, uh, uh, the work over to China. And, you know, Buy American is just, uh, where I come from anyway, a no-brainer, and, and it should be everybody in this country's uh, cause celeb to Buy American. Uh, we shouldn't have any problem with that. Obviously, the labor standards portions of, of the bill uh, uh, are problems for people who are uh, uh, running companies that are now and uh, allowed to be under law anti-union. Um, and, you know, in order to get all this government money, they're going to have to conform to some labor standards that they really don't like because it actually costs them money. It also does things like, make them pay attention to health and safety, which, you know, they don't always do. And uh, it's, it's one way to, to protect uh, their own employees, and it's the way to protect uh, the, the workers in the United States. Um, you know, why, why did they go overseas? Obviously, the, the answer to that is obviously it's cheaper. And, you know, uh, they've gone to countries where, for instance, GE going to China or India, uh, they've gone to countries where there is no unionization and they're, they're afraid of what will happen if uh, they, they come back and they have to abide by labor standards under the law. Uh, but, you know, I applaud the Biden administration. Finally, we have a, a president and an administration that is paying attention to the working people in this country. And this guy is the most union friendly president we've had in my lifetime and I'm pretty old. So uh, I've seen a lot of presidents and uh, this guy uh, walks the walk and talks the talk and he really means it. So, you know, uh, the provisions in these bills are just uh, uh, basic. Let's protect our own economy for a change instead of using government money and then sending jobs overseas or sending jobs to, manufacturers or to uh, uh, contractors that are only in it for one thing, and that's to make money. They don't care about the United States. All they care about is their pocket. So that's my answer to your question, Laura. That's great. Thank you, Chris. And I think, I mean, if we think about just um, the U.S. government converting its federal, local, state government uh, vehicle fleet to electric, you know, uh, building offshore wind turbines in the U.S. to supply the wind energy that we're creating, um, you know, manufacturing the products that we're going to need for building energy efficiency work, even just in government buildings, we're talking about, you know, thousands and thousands of jobs that could be high quality family and community sustaining jobs. So 
again, just you know, really excited about the opportunities here. I want to continue the conversation on the importance of worker protections, the right to organize and collectively bargain, um, have that collective voice and democratic voice on the job, um, the importance of wage and training standards, and go to, to you, John Doherty. Um, you know, the painters have done a lot of work to advance the PRO Act. Um, it would be great if you just say a few words about why the PRO Act is so important to addressing the climate crisis and the crisis of inequality in the U.S., and given that it's most likely that only some aspects of the PRO Act will be included in the bipartisan bill and the reconciliation package, um, how can organized labor, from your perspective, um, best use this opportunity to improve the quality of clean energy jobs, grow and strengthen the labor movement, and also expand access um, to those good jobs to frontline communities? Um, John Doherty, I'll go to you. Wow, I have more than a few words to say about that. <laughs> Um, I mean, first of all, workers are the engine to this economy. Um, we haven't had real labor law reform in decades, uh, and it's been chipped away for the longest time um, by people on the other side that are anti-worker and want to see profits go up before they pay living wages out to anybody doing the work that enriches them. Um, for us, for our union, we made it a top priority uh, amongst you know, a cavalcade of issues that are out there right now. We're talking about climate, equality, justice, and things like that. Uh, we see the PRO Act as uh, putting labor standards in the American lexicon. Uh, to put that idea out there that people are now talking about, you know, what it means to collectively bargain, what it means to join a union and have benefits that are provided by that, uh, really getting down to it, what it means for workers to have power. Uh, against, not against their employer, but, you know, for their own well-being and be able to push that. So we saw that as an opportunity for us to keep that dialogue uh, going within every issue that we tackle. Right now, we're talking about the climate crisis. We're talking about uh, putting renewables up. We're talking about housing retrofits. We're talking about school building retrofits, transportation, all of those issues when combined with worker power and collective bargaining are going to provide the wages, the benefits that keep more people in better jobs, provide pathways and careers, and lift up our entire economy, especially those local economies that are impacted by climate crisis um, that need jobs so much and need these career pathways and need better wages. Uh, they haven't seen that opportunity in, in a lot of cases, never. I know that uh, somebody had made the point, you know, when we're talking just transition and what that means to different communities, um, you know, in on one side, we're looking to put people uh, that are impacted by, you know, the transition to a cleaner energy economy uh, to get, you know, to be placed in good jobs. Um, in another community, you're talking about people who are never located in those jobs to be placed into uh, jobs. We have to ensure uh, that those are good jobs. And the way to do that is the labor standards that are contained in the PRO Act. Uh, the utilization of our registered apprenticeships, making sure that people in those communities get the training, the health and safety, uh, and are qualified to, you know, keep our uh, infrastructure more resilient. Uh, in our industry, what we do is um, a lot of protective coating. So we, we coat uh, our, our nation's water infrastructure. We make sure that that is resilient uh, against the climate so that there aren't spills uh, that, that contaminates don't get into our drinking water. Those are the type of jobs that require a lot of training uh, that we provide across the country for people. And it's an opportunity to provide careers to those uh, with the amount of infrastructure funding that's coming in. That being said, um, it really depends on the level of infrastructure funding. I know we mentioned a few minutes ago um, that, you know, moderates are scaling back. Uh, Republicans just don't want any at all. Um, and the level of funding that we need in, to enable us to be able to get into communities and organize to the maximum benefit uh, has to be at a level that provides new opportunities and new jobs and new sectors to get in, not just the jobs that we already have, being that we're still reeling from a pandemic uh, and a recession, um, that the, the low level of funding that moderates are talking about just puts people that were already in those sectors back to work. 
if we're talking about creating a, you know, a mega workforce, a giant jobs program that's going to bring our country back better, as we say, um, that level of funding has to be up there. We need to be able to provide those opportunities that match our organizing efforts out in those communities. Otherwise, those become dead-end conversations. If you can't provide Americans jobs, um, then what's the sense of getting out there and actually doing anything? It becomes lip service. Uh, these gentrified communities across the country are really just photo ops uh, to build a facade that looks like our country is doing well. Uh, but really, when you look into the donut around those uh, gentrified communities of people that actually live and work in those industries, um, you're not seeing the same benefit. In order to get those benefits, we need to have funding at a level that enables us to organize. The PRO Act, uh, having coupled with that level of funding, uh, will actually give us the opportunity then and educate more people on what it means to collectively bargain, what it means to have benefits and retirement security and, and build that up. In fact, I think the PRO Act being out there in the lexicon that it has been uh, is partly the reason why labor unions now are favored among Americans uh, by 68%. Uh, so it's largely popular that to be in a union, I don't know that everybody knows what it means to be in a union, but I think the PRO Act is enabling people to have that conversation and actually build that up. That's great. Thank you so much, John Doherty. Um, so well said about the connection between the size and scale of these investments um, that we need to see from the bipartisan infrastructure bill and the reconciliation. Um, the size and scale of these investments is, you know, intimately linked to the levels of job creation we're going to see, the amount of clean energy um, activity we're going to get going, um, our ability to get these jobs to, to frontline um, disadvantaged communities. So um, thanks for, for reiterating the importance there. Um, John Podesta, I want to go back to you. We've got just a couple minutes before we go to our audience for questions. Um, you know, you obviously are really familiar with the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, um, the ARA package that Obama did. Um, what lessons did we learn from ARA when it comes to high quality job creation and tackling climate change? Um, I think that's an important uh, uh, piece to look at in this moment. And related, you know, a big part of making these two bills successful is going to be implementation. How do we actually get the money out the door, get people to work? Um, what do you think unions, environmental organizations, others need to be prepared for to ensure that the implementation of these final packages is, is successful and the work gets going as soon as possible? Yeah, th uh, thanks, Laura. Um, well, I, you know, I ran the Obama transition where we put together the Recovery Act. It was the first piece of legislation passed uh, by Obama. It was the largest uh, investment in clean energy uh, to date in history. Hopefully we'll see that surpassed uh, in the bills we've been talking about, but $90 billion in strategic clean energy, uh, that leveraged another $150 billion uh, in the uh, in private sector investment. The Council of Economic Advisors said that created 900,000 uh, job years in, in the clean energy field, fields, made them the fastest growing parts uh, of the economy between 2009, 2015. Um, and I think uh, it, it, was a, it was generally uh, a, a story that also drove down, it, it really set off the renaissance in, in uh, renewable, in wind and, and solar power. Uh, the uh, cost of solar uh, of producing solar power went down very rapidly, as did wind. And that's what really is in the promise of this recovery package and the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Put that all together, you get that virtuous cycle of investment, job creation, innovation, putting people to work, giving them good jobs, and doing it uh, in the in the U.S. And I want to support what, what Chris and, and, and John uh, just said. The issue, I think, uh, is um, we've been sort of some extent discussing on this panel is you got to get it done quickly. You got to move that money. You got to uh, hopefully, if the federal government's throwing the pitch 
there's someone there to catch the ball. <laughs> and that's why these state-based efforts are so critical, whether they're in states or cities. We have friends across the country who believe uh, in both doing this work to solve the climate crisis and doing it in a way that will support uh, good uh, paying family sustaining jobs that will support the unionization of those sectors. Uh, and we've got to the uh, one of the things that I think uh, President Biden promised as he was coming into office and he's largely fulfilled it would was that he would have a whole of government ever. Every uh, cabinet secretary had a role to play. Every department of the federal government had a role to play. But they can only do that in partnership with mayors, with governors, with school boards, with county commissions across the country. And that's why I think the organizing work now is so important. So even in the if, if we have a good news story to tell, we're out there. But there is a lag between that money flowing and the and the projects uh, being apparent in, uh, in people's uh, uh, neighborhoods. Uh, and that's why it's really also critical to what we like to refer to as winning the win. If we are successful, we can't give up on telling the American people what just happened. We have fundamentally changed the economy and changed their lives. And they need to know it against a slew of disinformation that's coming from the right, coming from Trump, coming from, uh, you know, from Fox News and other places. So we're going to have to go out. We, we, even if we're successful in the Congress, we can't stop selling the program. And, uh, you know, that's just going to be an ongoing project as we tackle the climate crisis. That's great. Thank you, John. You really sort of uh, lay out our marching orders here. Um, I want to take uh, one more question uh, before we go to the audience. I want to go to you, Marilyn. Um, I think the thing that we haven't touched on here is what are the implications of these two bills for the international negotiations? Um, as I said at the beginning, Biden uh, rejoined the Paris Climate Accord. Um, we have the UN United Nations Climate Summit in Glasgow coming up in uh, just about a month. Can you say a little bit about what these bills might mean for the global leadership and competition and the U.S. participation in these agreements? Um, I think that would be helpful for our audience to hear. There we go. Yeah, you're right. The uh, 26th UN Climate Change Conference is going to take place in Glasgow, November 1 and 2, I believe. Um, you know, and I wanted to put the bills in the context of our negotiation uh, abilities. We are seen as an international leader in science te and technology. You know, being uh, from a university as you are, we know the strength of our science. We've been a crucible for, for creating better solutions, but the U.S. has not been a leader in the deployment of clean energy technologies at scale. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and the Build Back Better bill could change all of this. As John Podesta has said, these bills are complementary, and together they would be transformational. They'll show that the U.S. can both innovate and deploy clean tech in its own domestic markets. So I think they're going to strengthen the hand of the U.S. Uh, negotiators going into the Global Climate Summit. It's not just all going to be talk. It's going to show commitment. You know, ultimately, the climate crisis requires an all-hands-on-board approach. These bills will galvanize countries around the world to, to transition to cleaner energy and uh, more energy efficient economies. And in the US, they'll galvanize citizen action. We need action at all levels. Every neighborhood, every state, uh, state house has got to take action. All of our legislatures. In Georgia, I've led the research that underpins a project called Drawdown Georgia for the past three years. And we've crafted a plan very interactively with lots of stakeholders that use 20 solutions to cut, that could cut, have identified 20 solutions that could cut the state's CO2 emissions in half by 2030. But to achieve this goal, we need supportive government policies. And these two bills would be just that. 
That's great, Marilyn. Um, I am excited to look up that Georgia plan. You'll have to send it over to us. Uh, thanks, um, Marilyn. Thanks to all of our wonderful panelists for this uh, excellent discussion. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, Zach Cunningham, um, to present some questions from the audience um, to our panelists. I know you all have been waiting patiently, so we want to get you in here. Um, Slido, you're seeing that pop up on your screen. Um, that's what we're using to ask questions. Um, scan the QR code, um, type in the event number 464766 on slido.com, and you can get your question up. Um, for now, Zach, I'll go over to you and see if we have received some questions from the audience. Hey, thank you, Lara. We've gotten lots of great questions. We won't be able to get to them all, but I'll start by directing one towards John Doherty from The Painters. So uh, there have been lots of questions around equity. So people asking about how do we recruit a diverse clean energy workforce, what sorts of programs there are for workers transitioning from fossil fuel industries, land restoration and remediation work. Um, on any of these topics, I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit about what needs to be done to advance these equity goals, and specifically, is there anything in the bills we're talking about uh, that speaks to those ends? So I would say number one is funding. Number two is outreach. Um, we already do a ton of outreach into communities. We have a lot of programs stood up. Um, along with pre-apprenticeship programs, the, the National Build and Trades has pre-apprenticeship programs stood up all over the country. Um, we do have green technology curriculum in those uh, projects, and we're talking to the Department of Energy right now um, to make sure that we are highlighting the fact that those opportunities are out there. Uh, but number one goes back to funding. Uh, will the funding be in place to ensure that there are projects to put people on? Um, as far as uh, labor standards goes, uh, will there be uh, apprenticeship utilization so that as we're doing the outreach in those communities, we have a pathway to put those people into pre-apprenticeships that ultimately end up in a registered apprenticeship uh, that create those green technology jobs? So again, number one is funding. Number two is outreach. We have to ensure that you know we make a commitment that we are in those communities and that we are uh, providing those pre-apprenticeship opportunities uh, within those impacted communities. Thank you, John. And uh, speaking about the policy elements of these two plans, I'm gonna go to Marilyn next. So Adam says that he hasn't heard much about the importance of supporting energy efficiency retrofits, including heat pumps uh, and creating good union jobs and was wondering if folks could say more about that. Yes, the uh, Build Back Better bill has a lot of energy efficiency provisions and funding in it. So sorry, we didn't have a chance to highlight that in addition to uh, more funding for the weatherization assistance program, which will help to bring resources to low income households. There also are grants and support for uh, the retrofitting of homes and offices. Um, heat pumps, of course, are gonna be part of that. It's a, it's a natural, it is part of the necessary transition to a more electric economy. Heat pumps are, you know, uh, on the top of our list in Drawdown, Georgia, for instance, as something we need to do more of and support. And you'll find that support is in the bill. Great. And another specific policy question, I'll send this one towards John Podesta. Um, so Peter from the Citizens Climate Lobby had asked about pricing carbon. And if there's any uh, thing about this specifically in the uh, reconciliation bill and what your th thoughts are around that concept. Uh, well, look, I think that the idea that polluters should pay the cost of their, uh, their pollution has been a long tradition uh, in, in our country. And uh, there have been proposals put forward in this legislation there are obviously, there are carbon pricing schemes around the country in California, the so-called REGI uh, cap and trade system in, in, in New England uh, to be, to try to create efficient uh, programs to 
support clean energy and, and uh, deal with the effects of carbon pollution on our communities. Uh, so far, the uh, again, there are ideas that have been thrown out there. Chris Van Hollen has a uh, interesting proposal that would uh, tax particularly the major oil and gas companies for the damage that the pollution has caused. There's a provision that would uh, be an essentially uh, uh, an incentive program that would uh, put a co- price in, in essence on the cost of methane leakage from oil and gas production. Um, I mentioned that the bipartisan infrastructure bill has uh, a lot of money in to close up leaking uh, existing wells that are not productive but are still leaking methane, which is a very powerful uh, greenhouse gas. Uh, this would go further and say in going forward in production of oil and gas, you got to control the leakage of methane um, or pay a fee if you don't. Uh, and there's some talk, at least in the Senate, of, of putting price on on carbon, whether that uh, it's not been the heart of what the president's proposed. I think he looked at what was successful in the states and built a strategy around investments, uh, standards, and equity, ensuring that 40% of those investments would go to frontline and fenceline communities that have borne the brunt uh, of pollution uh, over the years. But there's still interest in it. Um, and it goes to one other international thing. I'm sorry to be so long-winded. But the uh, at some point, we've got to uh, impose essentially a carbon border adjustment on countries that are producing materials uh, without taking into a cost, uh, the account the cost of their pollution uh, and push the whole world up the chain of producing clean products. Europe's on track to do that. They've uh, put down a proposal to do that. We need to, the United States in combination with Europe the UK, Canada, and others can really, I think, move the overall global economy forward to have a high road, high standard um, uh, trading system. But that, you know, that's going to take a fair amount of work. Uh, So it's, it's, um, you know, it's a valuable tool, but we'll see whether the final product includes any of uh, the things that I mentioned. Thank you, John. And uh, since John has expanded the conversation to talk about international efforts, I'll go to John Cartwright next and just ask John if you could comment at all. Uh, You had a federal election in Canada last night, and some folks are interested in uh, getting your take on the results of that election and what it might mean for international efforts to combat climate change moving forward. Well, very little actually changed with our election. We had a minority liberal government before. We've got a minority liberal government now. They're generally committed to climate action, but they have some pretty weak spots. They <clears throat> spent $5 billion of taxpayers' money to buy a pipeline that nobody thought was necessary. Uh, but on the world stage, uh, they have played a good role. I think it's – I want to come to a couple things. One is the labor movement across this world is also in conversation, uh, particularly around issues of just transition. And we got that in, you know, in Paris, we did not get it in the main body of the document. We got it in subsequent documents coming out of these, these, uh, these programs. Um, but the words just transition means different things to a lot of people. And uh, we've now moved towards the, the, the phrase that this is about a job rich transition to a sustainable economy. Uh, cities play a huge role. And all across this world, cities have often been the first leaders and this is where the labor movement also has a lot of influence. If you look at your, your, you know, the building trades, you look at municipal unions, education unions, there's a lot of influence they have at the city level, and you can easily get cities to step up and support the very elements of the plan that you're talking about. I think that's one of the other alliances that I really want to bring forward uh, there. And then on the issue of, uh, of uh, equity, you know, the reality is when I look at my industry and I look around people in some of the job sites, it's still not reflective of our communities. And we got to acknowledge that dismantling systemic racism is actually hard work, but it's part of what we've got to do in order to, to, to take this to the right place. I'm going to end with a story at an international, which was in Paris, 
in 2015. And Ken Smith, who was a leader of the workers up in the, in the oil sands, uh, was in a room with about 400 trade unionists and got up and said, people ask, I'm, I'm an oil worker, why am I here? And I, I used this explanation. He'd been a zinc miner and the mine ran out. He said, just imagine you're a family, uh, you're, you're working hard, you've got a nice home on the, on the edge of the suburb uh, uh, where you live, and suddenly a forest fire breaks out. You are grabbing, uh, you and your wife and your two kids grab everything you can in your arms. You run away from that fire, you try and escape it, suddenly you come to a river. And now you've got a choice. You can either try and swim across and throw everything away you've got. You can stand and perish. Or if you started earlier, you could have built a bridge. And that's what's in front of us now, is figuring out how we build that bridge so everybody sees that bridge is for them. Every community, uh, indigenous people, black and brown communities, uh, you know, blue collar workers, white collar workers, uh, uh, you know, and even, you know, more enlightened business leaders are saying we're building this bridge together. Thank you, John. And I'll pick up on one point that you raised there, John, about the role that municipal unions have in pushing this agenda forward and uh, pose a question to Chris. So I know CWA represents lots of people in the public sector. And we have a question from an AFSCME member about how do we get public sector unions and public sector unionists motivated to take on this fight and to help with the implementation of the American uh, Jobs Plan, even though there might not be a direct job stake uh, in it the way there might be for construction union members. And you're muted, Chris, if you could unmute. Again, sorry. Um, there's absolutely a direct connection between uh, municipal workers or government workers and, and this plan because, um, you know, uh, when people are working and there's more jobs, people pay taxes, and that's what pays uh, the, the people who work for the government. That's what pays municipal workers. That's what pays uh, county and state workers, and uh, th this is all, and and it improves the economy all around. And when the economy is improved, obviously the state and governments can afford to to keep people working. And 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 this is everybody, every working person that there is should be on this bandwagon and trying to get these bills passed and trying to get this done because a. Uh, climate change affects everybody, no matter where you are, what you do, or, or how you uh, go about your life. And uh, second of all, all this stuff does. Every single thing that's in these bills will improve the American economy. And when the economy is improved, everybody benefits. Great. Thank you, Chris. And that unfortunately wraps up the time that we have for audience questions. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted really thoughtful questions. I'll turn it back over to you, Lara, to close us out. Sure. Yeah. Thank you, Zach. And thank you to our audience for those um, great questions. We really appreciate it. Um, before I close, I want to see if any of our panelists have any closing comments that they'd like to add um, based on Ali Zaidi's comments earlier or questions that you just heard from the audience, responses to, to the other panelists. Um, I'll let you uh, uh, jump in if you have some closing comments. And, and John Doherty, maybe I'll start with you. Thanks, Laura. Um, I would just say, and I'll be real brief because to me it's simple math. Uh, we have an opportunity right now um, with infrastructure funding to provide uh, hundreds of thousands of jobs across the country. Uh, we need to make sure that those jobs have labor standards attached to them so that we can ensure that people have collective bargaining power in those and have the careers uh, that this country was you know, built upon. Um, Biden is known for saying unions built the middle class. We actually did that. That's why he says that. <laughs> Um, in order to keep doing that, though, we need to make sure that, you know, we are connecting the dots, uh, that we are staying ahead of it, and, and that these jobs, the money that's coming out is transparent, so that we have the pipeline opportunity to look at those and get in there as it happens. At the levels that the funding is at, in order for us to organize, we need to do it in a strategic way. We need to look at those opportunities, and we need to be there and make sure that we have capacity built up in order to capture those opportunities. Um, so for us, it's really just uh, fund, outreach, and organize. 
get those opportunities in those communities that need them the most. That's great. Fund, outreach, and organize. Uh, we'll, we'll keep uh, saying that. That'll be our mantra coming out of this panel. Um, thank you, John. Um, John Cartwright, any uh, last uh, comments you'd like to make? Well, I think, you know, there's a whole generation uh, that is seized with this issue. That, you know, one, do I get a job at some point in time in my life? But secondly, climate, and we saw the Fridays for Future, the huge outpouring, you know, before COVID uh, shut that down. They expect others to bring answers, people in decision-making roles to bring answers. And I think it's incumbent on the labor movement in every city and every region uh, in, in your country, in my country, across this world, to reach out, to be part of a, uh, of a vibrant and powerful movement in the local places we live. So young people see that labor is part of the solutions and the future they want and that'll help them sign the union card. It'll help them support legislation. It'll help them get involved in the political process to elect people who will help make these kinds of, uh, of proposals and make this a future. So it's the next generation thing. We got to figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, John Cartwright. Um, Chris Shelton, let me go to you next. Closing thoughts? Uh, just, you know, uh, when, when everybody uh, at this seminar and everybody at this meeting thinks about this, they got to say to themselves, well, okay, I'm for climate change. Oh, I'm not for climate change. I'm for uh, fixing climate change and I'm for, uh, for creating uh, good jobs that uh, people can live on and uh, that the, the, the two bills that are up before Congress do just that. And if those bills don't pass, then what's the answer? And if we don't support them, how are they going to get passed? And it, it's, mark my word, if this doesn't happen. And, you know, if the Republicans have their way, it's not going to happen. We, we, we face a, a, a country that people can't work, that the economy will be terrible, and uh, we'll have a Republican uh, uh, we might have Trump back, which I, I can't even uh, understand. John, I may move to your country if that happens. But, um, you know, th this, is, uh, this is an absolute necessity, and everybody who can do anything to make it happen should be doing it and making it happen. Yeah, yeah I think that's uh, really important because I think we can't understate the sense of urgency um, uh, to this situation, this current political moment, and the relevance of these two bills to the 22 elections. So, um, yes, I completely agree. Um, John Podesta, you want to weigh in um, uh, before we wrap up the panel? I'll just be real quick. Uh, we've seen, we don't need any more evidence of the risk. We've had a full summer, a full year. It's happening all over the world. But this is also a tremendous opportunity to build back a more just, equitable, and sustainable economy. And it links, it links directly to, I think, uh, building an economy back out of the COVID crisis. If we do this important work, we're going to create that cycle of job creation. Uh, it'll be good for business. It'll be good for communities. It'll deal with... Uh, the justice issues and racial inequality across the country. Uh, and there are no excuses. You know, the Republicans have kind of abandoned ship. So it's up to the Democrats to get this done. And there's no excuse for failure at this stage. And I think that uh, failure will bear a heavy political cost. So we need to do everything we can just in this next period of time to get this thing over the finish line. There's so much good stuff there. We just got to get it done. Uh, and then uh, I think people will be rewarded for it because the public is with us. We're not actually asking members almost in every district to cast a tough vote. <laughs> the American people want to see this happen. So that's my, that's, that's my conclusion and that's my pitch. Absolutely, John. Thank you. And thanks for your advocacy. And I mean, gosh, the support for unions, the support for climate action is so high. It keeps going higher. So um, absolutely. Let's get this done. Um, Marilyn, final thoughts from you. 
Yep. I wanted to uh, try to broaden the scope of the impacts of these two bills beyond what we've been discussing today. Uh, you know, we've talked a lot about jobs that are going to be in the manufacturing sector for EVs, for wind turbines, for heat pumps, for solar panels, for energy management systems, and all variety of new equipment. But there are also going to be these secondary supporting jobs. Everyone will benefit from this. They don't tend to be highlighted. That was my uh, statement about, what did I say? food, fashion, and fun, I don't know how to call it, I'll put it all, wrap it all together, you know, we'll be eating better, I'll be able to buy my next great outfit, I'll be able to take a vacation, maybe I'll be able to have more uh, domestic help, I'll get more, spend more on my education and uh, services, you know, everyone is going to see a bolstering of economic activity, we will all benefit from the jobs that will be created Sometimes that doesn't get emphasized enough, in my opinion. So thank you, Laura, for putting on this jobs-oriented panel. It was great. Thank you, Marilyn. And I think um, that is an important reminder about the world that we're trying to build, right? Um, and the more sustainable, more socially, racially, economically just yeah. um, world that we're trying to build. So uh, I think that's a, a good sort of lasting vision to leave us with. Um, I want to, again, thank Zach and our audience for the great questions. I want to thank our panelists for their insight, um, their participation today, and, you know, most importantly, the important and incredible work that you and your organizations are doing. Um, you know, that's, that's what's critically important here. And I hope that everyone who's been tuning in today is feeling inspired and energized after this panel um, to help the U.S. seize this opportunity to tackle the climate crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, um, you know, build back better as we've been talking and create the high quality um, jobs our communities need and really drive these investments and opportunities into frontline and underserved communities that are um, being most impacted by the climate crisis and the COVID-19 pandemic. So as you know, some of our panelists mentioned, uh, we haven't had an opportunity like this in a long time. Um, so let's uh, leave here and uh, let's get to work.